Welcome everyone to the Tesco webinar featuring JDSU who will discuss ensuring fiber optic systems performance in the radio access network. I'm John Celentano with Tesco and I will be your moderator for this webinar. 4G LTE deployments are well underway uh, among both national and regional carriers. Earlier generation radio technology relied on coaxial cable connection between the radio in a hut or a shelter on the ground and an antenna up on the tower. By contrast, 4G radios are a combination of remote radio units, or RRUs, that are the RF amplifiers located up on the tower next to the antennas, and the baseband unit, or BBU, that is installed in a shelter on the ground. Now, however, the RRU is connected to the BBU with fiber optic cable. The transmission benefits of the split configuration are twofold. One, close proximity of the radio to the antenna improves RF transmission performance, and two, Fiber optic cable eliminates RF losses inherent with transmission over coaxial cable, again improving the signal transport performance. All of this improvement assumes, of course, that the fiber optic uh, cable is installed properly and tested to ensure clean optical transmission. But we all know that we have to be careful about making such assumptions, and that's what we will talk about this afternoon. Before we get started, let me cover a few housekeeping items. <coughs> The webinar is scheduled for one hour, and it will end at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. All lines will be on mute so we can have an uninterrupted presentation. However, you will be able to ask a question at any time during the presentation using the chat feature, and I encourage you to do so. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation, and we'll get to as many as time permits. If we run out of time, we will answer the questions offline, and we'll uh, post these uh, answers uh, on our website. I will give you the link at the end of the presentation. Know also that this webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay uh, again uh, through uh, a link to our website, which we will post later. Our presenter today is Mike D, Fiber Optic Program Manager with JDSU. Mike is a 15-year uh, veteran uh, with uh, and has spent much of his time in the uh, working with JDSU in fiber optic fiber optic field. Uh, Mike has been working for 15 years with uh, JDSU with customers on uh, various telecommunication telecommunications test application, and he is a specialist in fiber optic testing for the past 10 years. Mike has seen people bring down fiber optic networks and cause permanent damage in the most creative ways. By seeing what not to do, he knows what to do to properly install, handle, test, and troubleshoot fiber optic networks to ensure network performance. Uh, I myself have been in, in telecommunications for over 25 years and uh, have uh, developed an expertise in network infrastructure planning and deployment. Uh, here at Tesco, uh, we are positioning uh, the company to, uh, for our customers who build, use, and maintain wireless networks. And with that, I'm going to ask Mike to uh, take over the presentation. I will uh, transfer the uh, the present, uh, presentation now. Mike, uh, over to you. Thank you, John, and welcome, everybody. And today we're going to talk about, as John mentioned, fiber optic cabling on the tower as well as fiber optic testing. So we're going to talk about the basic mobile network architecture nowadays, go over basic fiber theory. For most of us in the RF world, this is relatively new, if not totally bland, brand new to people. Talk about different kinds of testing we do to accept the fiber and turn it over to the provider, installation testing and troubleshooting, and then talk about some basic testers available, and then we'll have a conclusion with some question and answers. In terms of who JDSU is, we have five major areas of focus, and of the five, one of the markets that we focus on is mobility. We have over 4,300 customers globally in the telecom space, the service provider, both landline and wireless customers. That's our biggest customer base. We're close to a billion dollars in revenue every year. And in our market positions, globally, we're number one in the world with fiber optic market share with over 
300 employees. So there's some history on us if you're not aware of us. I am a fiber guy, so when we go to the traditional mobile base station deployment, you'll know more about this than I do. But typically, the BBU and RRU are co-located at the same spot. And that has some downsides, such as a large equipment footprint, high power consumption, high deployment cost, and of course we use the coax cable to go to the top of the tower to the antenna. As we go to 4G networks, now I hear the term e B, a new way of referring to the base station. Now as the base station and tower changes, the RRU or RRH goes at the top of the tower, the BBU is at the bottom, and they now are connected by fiber optic cabling. It's still hybrid cabling in the sense that there's fiber optics to go from the BBU to the radio, but you still have some cabling in there for alarms and power. When we talk about fiber optic elements, pieces of equipment, and cabling, a lot of stuff has a shelf life of 25 to 40 years. If you put cabling in there, a lot of manufacturers will say the last 25 years. They might say the last 40 years. The stuff lasts a long, long time. But your network is only as strong as your weakest link. And in fiber, the weakest link is where we physically connect two pieces of fiber together. In terms of where we see fiber, we are talking about fiber to the antenna. The service providers also have distributed antenna systems, and many times that's on a rooftop, so the contractor will still put in the antennas and the network equipment, but now they will actually see the service provider up on the tower with them. So we might see this in stadiums, malls, places where we have a lot of people concentrated together. And we also have the small cell deployment, we're now, if we're in a downtown area, a main street, or a place where we don't want to have big clunking antennas around, now we use much, much smaller devices. So if you're doing small cells, a DAS, or a fiber to the top of the tower, you still can have fiber in all three situations. If we have fiber to the tower, now we have the contract handling that. We have the provider handling the base station. We often have a third-party company doing Ethernet backhaul. So instead of T1 copper backhaul, it's now Ethernet backhaul over fiber. We often have dark fiber providers who give fiber to the wireless service providers. And then we also have the switch fiber. So there's more points to monitor, more protocols to test, more points of failure, and a lot more fiber all over the place. So the main thing for us is to ensure our portion of the network is tested properly, and during troubleshooting, we can rule it out and point to another area, or we can test it, troubleshoot it, and find our own problems. And one of the big reasons why we have to cover this is, for the last 100 years, when we make a connection, it's been a metal-on-metal -metal connection. If I was a telegraph operator, Dit, 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 dot, dot, dot. It was metal on metal. Electricity flows. Electri electricity carries a signal. We get our traffic. Then over 100 years ago, we had the telephone, our Ethernets, our T1s, our serial connections, our projectors, our laptops, our printers, our televisions. And, of course, our radios and antennas all have metallic connections, often copper, metal on metal. The electricity flows. Now when we go to glass which is fiber optics, it's basically invisible glass, it's tiny, and now we can have dirt and damage. So your old school, get my connector and plug it in, can cause huge issues nowadays. So we're going to talk a little bit about the basics of fiber optics. Many times in the sorrow we, we see single mode. Sometimes we see multi-mode. There's two basic types of fiber, and that's them, single mode and multi-mode. If we look at the cross-section here on a single-mode fiber, the gray dot in the middle is 9 microns typically, while well, a micron is one millionth of a meter in diameter. Because light leaks out of glass, you take that piece of glass and you surround it by another piece of glass. So basically you have a glass in a tube of glass. 
And that second tube of glass, this guy in the blue color here, is 125 microns. And that acts as a mirror to keep the light in the inner glass, the core. Your human hair is typically about 80 to 100 microns in diameter. So the fiber that the light travels down is tiny compared to a human hair. If you go over to multi-mode, the difference is the core, where the light travels, is bigger. Instead of being 9 microns, it's either 50 or 62.5. But even then, it's still half the size of a human hair. Typically, your fiber jumpers are going to have labeling, so you'll be able to know if it's a single mode or a multi-mode. Now we go to our connectors. Commonly, we will see the LC, the little connector, on towers or in the base station, and sometimes we see SC, but there's many different kinds of connectors. So in terms of testing, your tester either has to have the right connectors or you have to have a hybrid connector such as SC to plug into your tester and LC to plug into your network. In this picture here, we have two LCs side by side. Sometimes these cannot be separated for test purposes and sometimes they can. Additionally, you'll notice here that we see a green fiber connector. Green represents an APC, an angled physical contact. So a UPC fiber is cut straight, while an angled physical contact fiber is cut at an angle, and that's done to reduce back reflections. You may typically always work with a UPC connector, but be advised, somebody like me, uh, the service provider, somebody at the base station, a radio guy, somebody else may have a green connector while you're using blue. A study was done by NTT Advanced Technology, and 98% of the installers found that contamination of the connector interface was a problem that causes network failures. A break is a major issue. That stops our traffic. But once we put the cable up the tower and it's got a shelf life of 25 plus years, that thing's going to stay there forever unless we have some kind of massive storm, right? So the only vulnerable part is now the connections where we plug into the network. The other interesting thing for us is that when we say your fiber is UPC, it's supposed to be cut straight. But you see a little dome right here, and that's to ensure that the fiber that's in one connector touches the fiber in another connector. When you connect a LC to a LC or a SC to a SC, you will hear a click. There's plastic tabs that hold the connection together. That's two pounds of force. It's no big deal. However, it's two pounds of force over a circle that's 200 millionths of a meter in diameter. And that causes huge, huge, huge pressures, even though we typically aren't aware of that. So if you have dirt on the fiber, it's going to cause loss in the forward direction. It's going to cause back reflections. It can cause your laser or receiver to stop working, and it can also permanently damage the fiber. Traditionally, we connect fibers without looking at them, not verifying that they're clean. We get permanent damage, and then we find out the problem later. So here, there's dirt. We don't realize it. We connect it. We cause loss. We cause back reflections, and we cause damage. And most service providers of the world, most of their fiber problems are 75, 80, 85 percent of the time. Even on naval aircraft, the guy said 85 percent of his avionic problems came from dirty fiber connectors because we've all been metal on metal for 100 years, and we just don't realize what problems can cause by connecting a fiber together without looking at it. If I looked at a clean fiber with a microscope, you can see this is where my cladding was, 125 microns, and here's my white ferrule. But if I tap it with the end of my finger for a tenth of a second and just smack it, 98% of us have oil on our hands, and your clean fiber is going to get absolutely filthy just by touching your hand. If you touch the back of your hand, or your arm, it's not quite as oily, but it's still very easy to trash a fiber by just touching it. Now, if I click that 
dirty fiber to a clean fiber, this fiber was clean and now it's filthy. So you can see the transfer of oil. And notice we have a ring right here at about 200 microns. And this is a nice visual aid to show that there are actually huge forces involved when we connect the fiber. The forces push the liquid that's on the outside out. That's why we have this ring and that's why there's not very much oil right here. The oil in the middle has got nowhere to go, so it just stuck there. Now, if we had dirt in there, that dirt can explode into smaller pieces, and the smaller pieces of dirt can get actually stuck in the glass. So just like I drive my vehicle, a pebble can crack my windshield. You can get permanent damage by connecting a dirty fiber, and most of us don't realize it. In this case, in the upper left, we have an inspection of an image, and it has a very low loss and a very low back reflection. In the bottom picture here, picture number three, there's a couple of pieces of dirt, two pieces of dirt, look like they're about two millionths of a meter of diameter touching the core. Our back reflections get 30 dBs worse, which is a thousand times worsening, and we pick up 4.6 dBs of extra loss. On one span, on most towers, you're allowed 3 dBs of loss, and if you go up and down with a loop back, you're typically allowed 6 dBs of loss. You drop a fiber on the ground, and it's easy to get it this dirty, and you just picked up 5 dBs of total loss, so it's very easy to make a fiber fail. Additionally, there is an international standard for the cleanliness of a fiber. If I look at the picture on the left, I say, does this thing pass or fail? Well, if you use the standards on the right side, it actually looks at the dirt, sees how big it is, and gives a pass-fail based against the international standard. So that's one way if you do your fiber and turn it in with documentation, you can prove it was clean when you plugged it in, and now any problems at the base station or towards the switch are all going to come from the provider because the provider is also new to fiber, and they're connecting dirty as well. Other thing for us that is new is bending. If I'm a copper coax person going up the tower where there's a lot of clamping down stuff, nice and tight so nothing moves, if you squeeze down on fiber, you can cause a bend and make the traffic not work. The cable is tough. So follow those installation procedures, but at the end of the cable, you typically have the little jumpers coming out, and those are in very, very small protective coatings. If you close a lid on something, uh, tie it down too tight, tie it to a knot, and jam it into a little space, then you can have a bend, and that will make the system not work. So the summary of fiber basics is don't connect a single mode jumper to a multi-mode. I can shoot a garden hose into a fire hose, and the water will go through. But if you shoot a fire hose into a garden hose, you're going to get wet. So that's the same thing with single mode and multi-mode. Different size cores, don't connect them together. If you have an LC that's blue and my LC is green, don't connect them together. I'd say about 95% of the time the traffic is not going to work because it's a flat fiber connected to an angled. It causes huge losses, and normally your traffic doesn't work at all. Bends shouldn't be an issue in multi-mode fibers, but a bend in a multi-mode fiber may bring down the entire system on single mode. In the same way I can drive a Ferrari around an exit ramp fast, I can't drive a rental truck around an exit ramp fast because it's going to tip over. So the higher the wavelength, the more susceptible it is to bends. If you are using multi-mode fiber, realize there's different core sizes, 50 and 62.5. On your little jumpers, it will be labeled so you can see. Same thing there. Don't shoot a garden hose into a smaller hose because you're going to have a lot of loss. So on your one provider, you may have dual LC single mode UPC optics, but as you go from project to project, tower to tower, person to person, truck to truck, you're going to see single mode, you're going to see multi-mode, you're going to see APC, you're going to see UPC, you're going to see different connectors such as LC, SC, or Frank Charlie's. So you got to make sure you have the correct stuff so you can test properly as well as install and make the system work properly. So now we'll go into actual testing. 
there's two basic ways that we see the service providers test today. Since they don't climb the tower, they have their contractors do this. One way is a lost test, and we also certify the connectors. And the other way is an OTDR test, where once again we also certify the connectors to make sure everything is clean. You'll also see a common too is a visual fault locator. Basically, it's a red light shooter. The traffic we transmit at is invisible. So if you use a red light shooter and you want to verify you have continuity from the bottom to the top of the tower, you want to make sure you have plugged the fibers into the correct port. If you have a loop back and you want to make sure everything is wired properly, then you can shoot the red light and use it for a continuity check. So this guy here is shooting red light up the tower. He's got a loop back at the top, and over here I can see red light leaking out of this fiber. So he knows everything is wired properly because the light went up and down the tower. Here there's a bend on the jumper, and you can actually see the red light leaking out of the jumper. So we use this tool as a continuity tester, and also if the connector is busted, there's a break or a bend, the VFL is used for that as well. In this case, a VFL is tiny. You can get a bigger VFL that's more protective, or if you have a larger mainframe, you can also have a VFL on your larger mainframe, such as an OTDR, a common tool often required by the service providers. A basic loss test, similar to uh, RF, right? We care about loss. We use a source, we shoot at the power meter, and then we see the loss on that span. It is very common for the provider to say, use a loopback. So if I have pair one, there's a one transmit and one receive. So you shoot light up the tower, you have a loopback at the top, and the light goes from one up the tower, and it comes back down, one down the tower. So you test the transmit and receive at the same time. A source and power meter gives you a go, no go, or a pass, fail. If we put the cable in right and everything is clean, we plug it in, we should pass 98% of the time. And that's wonderful. Now we can turn over good fiber. If there's a problem, the source and power meter is not going to tell you where the problem is. And then once we do our loss testing, uh, many of the providers require that you document the inspection so they can verify that you're inspecting the fibers. In the RF world, I believe the word you use is calibrate. So in this case, you have a jumper on the source, a jumper on the power meter, and you put the loop back on here and you reference, calibrate it, or zero it out. We want to get the loss that's on the tower, and we don't want to get the loss from any of this stuff. So you hold the button here, the tester would go to zero, and now when you connect to your tower, you just get the loss in the tower, and you don't get the loss from your little jumpers that allowed you to connect to the tower in the first place. So in this case, this gentleman, and this is for a known service provider, shooting up the tower. There's a loop back at the top. The light comes back down to a power meter, and now he's doing his loss testing. So at the bottom, I require a source, a power meter, inspection devices, cleaning devices, and perhaps a red light shooter. And at the top, we need inspection devices, cleaning devices, and also a loopback device. If we go to the OTDR tester, it's the most versatile fiber tool there is because it can test up and down the tower to loopback, but it actually looks at individual events. So if there is a problem, the OTDR tells us where that problem is, measures the distance to an event, measures the loss of event, measures the reflection of event because of its dirty high reflection. And like the power meter, it can collect all the results, pass fail them, and then it allows us to turn in reports to show that we did a good job on our cable install. Some providers use a source and power meter, and some use the OTDR. And of course, they both have to use inspection at the top and the bottom of the tower. So in this case, we have the OTDR at the bottom. We expect at the top, we do a loop back. We shoot up fiber one, it comes back fiber two. 
We can see the distribution up top. We can see the radio up top. We see that everything is good. And then we store our results to turn them in with documentation. One thing new in the OTDR world is instead of having a handheld OTDR or a small OTDR, there are now hands-free OTDRs. So if you're at the top of the tower, you have the OTDR hung around your neck and tied around your waist so you can move, work, climb, clean, and inspect. Additionally, there is now mapping software. An OTDR is not digital. You have to be able to analyze it. Well, if I'm new to this, it might be kind of tricky. So with the mapping software, here it says bottom of the tower, top of the tower. Our mapping software lets you know there's a loopback at the top. So I have the loopback from the top to the other top. And then I'm coming back down. So I'm going up fiber one on the transmit side, coming down on the receive side. So I have bottom, top, top, bottom. And if I click on each event, it will tell me what happened. There's nothing supposed to be right here, but this says it's a bend. The OTDR detected it. If I click on this one here, it's in red. It says it's a bad connector. The loss is too high and the reflection is too high. Maybe we cheated and we didn't take a look at that. We didn't clean it and now we failed. So one of the shortcuts we see in the field is the guys will say, oh, I'm not going to inspect at the top because the OTDR can find the problem. But the problem is if you connect a dirty fiber, you may cause permanent damage. So a jumper is 10 bucks. You can throw it away. If you damage a cable, now you're going to go to a spare. And if you have any issues with that, you can't build a service provider. That's going to be in the contractor crew. The other thing is brand new fibers, when they inspect in volume, they tend to be dirty 88% of the time. I was on the web once and the guy said, hey, six out of eight of mine brand new are dirty. I just inspected while you were speaking. That was 75%. You pulled out of the bag, I'm betting lunch that it's going to be dirty. Well, we don't know what was made. Japan, China, North Carolina. It goes in a ship or an airplane. It goes on a truck. And the truck is 140 degrees in the daytime, 70 degrees at nighttime. Then we go in the building. It's air conditioning. We have humidity. We have rain. We have heaters and air conditioning. And with all the pressure and temperature changes and outgassing of all the little plastic stuff, this stuff is typically dirty. Most airborne dirt wipes right off. I have seen brand new stuff where the dirt has become what I call a mud pie. It gets caked on and baked on where it's stuck due to moisture and humidity and pressure and temperature changes. So now you can do a dry clean and it doesn't come off. So now you need to have a wet clean because 6, 8, 10 dry cleans isn't going to do it. So you can test with your OTDR all you want and it's still not going to be clean and you're causing it to get worse and worse and you're causing permanent damage. So if that's the case, you need to inspect at the top. If it's clean, plug it in, wonderful. If it's dirty, you clean it once or twice. Then it's clean, you plug it in, wonderful. And if it doesn't get clean, now you need to use some solvent, just like I sometimes have to use Windex and a windshield, mirror, or glass. If you do a wet solvent clean, then you need to dry it because you don't want to leave any glaze on there. Your solvents will dry, and now it has a glaze. Glaze is delicious on a Krispy Kreme donut, but on your fiber, it causes loss and back reflections. So as fiber testing required, your BBUR you may be green, but that doesn't guarantee the system is going to work. If you dropped your fiber in the ground, picked up a piece of mud on it, and plugged it in, the system is never going to work until you get that thing clean and hopefully you didn't cause permanent damage. Our BBU may have dust caps as our Fibers at the end of the cable, but just because you have a dust cap on there does not mean it's clean. I'll bet lunch that you can expect a brand new fiber with a dust cap on, and it's going to be dirty. Manufacturers, the radio folks, ship stuff brand new to you, clean. It gets dirty during shipping. So a lot of times I say, I don't got to worry about the base station. I don't got to worry about the distribution box at the bottom. That's the radio person. If you're making fiber connections, the stuff needs to be clean. So there's some other points there. It's very simple, fast, and cheap to clean. But by not cleaning, causing permanent dam damage, the ramifications of times in terms of time, labor, and cost and responsibility are significant. 
In the U.S., we've seen a service provider with 40% failure rates on turnip fiber to the tower. In Canada, we've seen one with 45% failure rate, and they were able to get it down to 5% once they got the education and the proper tools. Asia Pacific, we've seen 30%. I've seen a contractor who said, uh, yeah, Mike, I have a 50% success rate on my fiber to the top of the tower turnips. And I thought I was being polite. I said, isn't that the same as a 50% failure rate? And he goes, yeah, it's awful. We're, we need to get better. So if you can handle a 50% failure rate by not inspecting and not following the proper practices, then go ahead and, and go for it. Um, but I asked the tower folks, if there was a problem, who pays for it? Well, if there was a lightning strike, earthquake, wind damage, right, it's not the contractor's fault. Maybe insurance or the provider's got to pay for new stuff. But if you're damaging stuff at the top of the tower by not inspecting it or just cleaning it and not inspecting it, you can't blame the service provider. You're going to have to pay for it. Now, instead of doing your next job and getting a lot of money, you're doing reworks. So if you do it right the first time and certify it and document it, you have proof it was done good. There's no re-rolls. There's no re-climbs. You go out making more money. You get it right the first time. And if there are any issues, you can say, hey, it's not the tower. Let me go test it. You got the base station plugged in dirty or it's on the Ethernet backhaul. Additionally, by putting fiber, we now have a new protocol. Uh, CIPRI in the U.S. or obviously overseas, many times the service provider would test that, but our basic TBIR testers for Ethernet testing or T1 backhaul testing, now we can do CIPRI testing as well, which is a common public radio interface. That's the way the radio talks to the BBU. So for RF installation and testing and troubleshooting, all that stuff still applies, right? Because I have fiber. If the fiber is beautiful, I still have to send my RF traffic over that connection. So JDSU does have base station analyzers. Uh, we're excellent at this stuff. Uh, some of you might not be aware of it. So if it's Ethernet backhaul, RF testing, fiber testing, fiber inspection, um, especially with Tesco, who is uh, so well-known in the RF industry, have a lot of our stuff available. They have the people to support you, and they're a one-stop shop for RF and RF testing. The other thing is, as we go to LTE, that lets us get the higher speeds, and the fiber also lets us get the higher speeds, and the fiber lets us support future applications. But when we go to LTE, we are now using a different modulation signal, so the fiber can be perfectly fine, but if you have poor, low, uh, poor modulation, all of a sudden you're going to start having data throughput issues on voice, video, and data. So once again, with our base station analyzer, we can actually do the modulation testing for LTE. So that can be something new as well for the folks who are used to doing traditional RF testing. There is a busy slide here, but on the fiber side, I often have an OTDR with inspection at the bottom or a source and power meter at the, at the bottom with inspection, knowing that the top there's a loopback. We do a loopback at the top for either loss testing or OTDR testing with a loopback. The people at the top require inspection devices and cleaning devices. I've had contractors say stuff like, I'm not bringing anything to the top. It's too expensive to bring to the top. I'm just going to clean at the top. The OTDR is going to find the problems at the top from the bottom. However, an OTDR at the bottom does not prevent permanent damage at the top, and you also have a hard time explaining why so many other providers are getting 30 40 and 50% failure rates. Now, you do have one advantage with uh, the JDSU solution, uh, because we purchased Westover, we make our own fiber inspection probes. All the other test equipment companies get them from somebody else or they get them from us. Because we believe it is an essential tool, not an accessory to be purchased from another company, we have a lot of different solutions. So if you go to the top of the tower, you can have a digital camera that auto centers, making it easy to find the image 
a handheld device that's not even handheld. It's hands-free, so you put it around your neck, and that will let you pass-fail and store all your images at the top of the tower. We are seeing service providers now require documentation for all fibers inspected at the top or at the bottom. I did have somebody tell me that documentation is useless, and my response is documentation ensures compliance, not only from the provider's point of view, but also from the contractor. I put in this stuff, here's my documentation, so when we turn it over, we know our stuff is good, everything else is on you. Additionally, when we inspect and we do our OTDR, we timestamp our images. So you can't take one picture of a connector in the office and submit that a thousand times with a different file name because the timestamp is with every image. So if you're at the top and you're going across, over, under, around, doing all your work, every time you store an image and pass fail it, we have a timestamp with it. And of course, we already mentioned the RF testing with the cell advisor, base station analyzer for cable and antenna uh, testing. And for the providers, they typically already have our inspection gear. They already have our T1 backhaul copper gear, and they already have our Ethernet optical backhaul gear. So fiber to the antenna, are you ready? Fiber is expanding wider and deeper than the networks. So you can't get any higher than fiber at the top of the tower. Additionally, we might be used to fiber going to the RU and then coax going from the RU to the antenna. I'm now seeing antennas that actually have fiber on them. So it's no longer a coax connection. You actually plug into the antenna with fiber, and that's because the antenna is both the antenna and the RU. That makes it extremely expensive, so now we need to make sure our fiber is cleaned and sure we don't break it and to ensure that it actually works. Additionally, if you need to do RF testing, I am told by my RF brothers and sisters that we're actually having a tool come out so you can plug into an antenna that is the RUN antenna and it has a fiber optic connection on it. If you have the correct tools and follow the correct practices, you prevent problems uh, from happening. If you don't, we've seen some of the consequences of that with huge failure rates when it costs a lot of money to go up and retest, repair, or replace. If the fiber is clean, then our traffic is going to work. If the fiber was put in band, lots of bands, dirty, no documentation, no pass-fail, no process from the provider, then your RF traffic isn't going to work. We do have some resources available to you. One is a quick start guide to fiber to the antenna. We call it fiber to the antenna. You will hear from some service providers. They may have a specific project name. We have a white paper. And also on the Tesco website, we have a lot of stuff that we talked about. The base station analyzer, OTDRs, handheld source and power meters, fiber optic inspection, and cleaning kits. So in terms of presentation, that is all the material we have today. So now we will check John's chat page to see if we have any questions. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, uh, we do have some questions, and uh, let me just take them in order <laughs> and let you, uh, let you respond accordingly. Our first question uh, uh, from Pete says, is a start fiber required? Okay, so is a start fiber required? And commonly, we would call that a launch cable in the OTDR world. If you're doing a source and power meter, you have a jumper on each one of those. So that would be a jump fiber or a start fiber. But when you connect those to each other, you calibrate them out, zero them out, or reference them out. When we say start fiber, in the fiber world, we commonly call it a launch cable. typically refers to the OTDR. Our software is made specifically for FTTA. If you have our FTTA software with the, the mapping feature, so we can get away with a 10 meter launch cable. That would be your start fiber. Uh, I've seen one data sheet that requires a 150 meter launch cable and one that required a 50 meter launch cable or start fiber. So somebody said, hey, Mike, you know, 10 meters, that's how am I going to climb that up? 
it's big, it's clumpy. When you when you wrap it, it's still pretty small, but compared to 150 or 50 meters, it's still cheap, it's still smaller, and probably only $20. The reason why I use that start fiber is so you can get the loss of the fiber that's plugged in at the beginning of your network. So when you have a start fiber or launch fiber, it lets you get the loss of the front end connector, which is the loss at the bottom of the tower, the last piece of fiber that comes out of the cable. If you don't have it, you can still test the whole entire span. You just don't get the loss of that very beginning connector. Most providers, if they have you use an OTDR, will require a start fiber. Once again, we call it a launch fiber, launch cable. And if you're using a source and power meter, you're going to have those as well. A source and power meter, they only need to be about three feet, one meter, one or two or three meter uh, standard jumper, and then you just reference them out, zero them out, calibrate them. Great. Our second question is, does JDSU have a tool to test interference between Wi-Fi and mobile frequencies? As the fiber guy, I do not specifically know that answer, so we can follow up with you on that one. But my RF brethren tell me that uh, our portfolio is excellent. We do very well if we go head-to-head -head against the competition, so we will have to follow up and get that answer to you. Well, here's another fiber question. Can fiber jumpers be tested with your equipment? Fiber jumpers can be tested, and one way you typically do it is to just use a source and power meter. So you rump it out, zero, I think you guys use the word um, calibrate. You calibrate out, ignore your reference jumper on your source and your reference jumper on the power meter. You put your little jumper in the middle, First, you've got to make sure it's clean because if your thing is filthy, it's going to fail a loss test. Both sides are clean. You shoot the light through, and then you see the loss of that little jumper. So a short jumper, 1, 2, 3 meters, 10 meters, should have a tiny amount of loss, and the source and power meter can do that as well. Great. Uh, our next question, uh, can I be provided with some kind of document on the training that I can read over in my free time? We have the references. Uh, I have no issue with you getting a copy of the presentation. And also, this is going to be recorded. So if you have any new guys or folks who missed, and right, I'm the guy, who, psh, I've never inspected my coax. Inspection is crazy. You don't got to clean it. You just plug it in. It works. I do it all the time. They may watch this. But if you want to see the material in writing, we can get you a copy of the presentation. The presentation is recorded. And we also have the written resources that are on the Tesco webpage if you want to see some additional stuff. Yeah, Mike, if you wouldn't mind, just back up the slide to the uh, resource page, and that way the uh, the URL that uh, all the information that we referred to here in this presentation can be accessed at www.tesco.com/go/jdsu. That's the JDSU portal page on tesco.com, and we have a, a, an abundant uh, an abundance of information uh, uh, available for you uh, to to download. Uh, here's another question, Mike. Uh, it appears my cleaning stick doesn't work sometimes. Okay, that's a common question that we get is I like the cleaning sticks compared to a clean top or you might have a box or a cube or a wipe. Those allow you to clean jumpers. You take the fiber jumper and you pull it across the tape, the optical tissue, and that cleans your jumper. If you have a cleaning stick, there's two manufacturers in the world of them. They can clean both the jumper, which is a male connection, but they can also clean a female connection, such as the patch panel, the distribution box, etc. The way the sticks work is the fiber goes into the stick, and you click the stick or push a button, and now the tape is pulled across the fiber. It's so the same manner if we want to clean a windshield, mirror, or glass. There are three pieces of dirt. I wipe it. Now I have two pieces of dirt, I wipe it, the two pieces of dirt became four, I wipe it, and it goes away. So that's the same thing with a stick. The tape comes directly across the fiber and it does a 180 twist. So you might have three pieces of dirt, then two pieces of dirt, and then you might have four pieces of dirt, and then you might have zero pieces of dirt. The other thing is your dirt can sometimes be stubborn. So if your children threw some pizza on your windshield or some yogurts, or who knows, a ice cream, right? And it dries, it gets stuck. 
Now your paper towel is not going to get it off. At that point, you need some solvent. It's the same way with fiber. If you get some caked on, baked on dirt, now you can take that stick, an optical wipe, put your cleaning solvent optical wipe, tap that stick in there. Now your first click is a wet clean, and your second and third is a dry clean. So if it's a stubborn piece of dirt that's baked on there, like a mud pie, you might need several wet cleans followed by several dry cleans. And the other thing is, if the fiber has been used for a while, if it's in your test bag and you've been doing testing with it, many, many, many times they have permanent damage on them. So I can go and look at your fiber, clean it dry two or three times, it doesn't work. Clean it wet two or three times, at some point I have to call it permanent damage. So most of us don't realize we can cause permanent damage, but if you go out to your windshield and a pebble smacks it and causes a crack, you can clean it all you want, right? You're not going to get rid of the crack, pit, chip, or scratch in your windshield. So that's the same thing on fiber. You can clean all you want, but if there's permanent damage in there, it's not going to come off. But many times you don't realize there's permanent damage. So I do think the sticks are very effective. But just because you clean it once, there's no guarantee it's going to be 100% clean 100% of the time. It takes many times, sometimes, two, three, four times. Sometimes it takes wet cleans, followed by dry, and sometimes it's permanent damage and we just can't get it off. Great. Uh, here's another question. Should I use an OTDR or a source and power meter? If the service provider didn't tell you what to use, I would use whatever you have. Certainly my recommendation is to use a loopback. If you have 12 pairs, that's 24 fibers. So you're either doing 24 loss tests if you have a source at the bottom and a power meter at the top, or you're doing 24 OTDR traces. So if you use a loopback, now you're cutting your test time in half because you're testing half as many fibers, right? You're testing two fibers at once. If the source and power meter is at the, at the bottom, then that can be my senior person, which is common anyway, and the person at the top just has to clean, inspect, and put on the loop back, and some providers' documentation is required. And the same way with the OTDR, if I have a loop back, I shoot up and down the one pair of fibers, I look at both fibers with one trace, store everything, so all my documentation, my test results, my pass fail can be done at the bottom. So I certainly always recommend the loop back. Typically, the service provider is going to tell you what to do. And they're going to tell you, I want a source and power meter with a loopback at the top, or I want an OTDR, and they will also give you requirements for your cleaning and inspection. Some providers do not require inspection documentation at the top of the tower, but that does not excuse you from looking at the fibers at the top because we've just seen too many failures where they're not doing it and they're having too many problems and too many failures. Additionally, if you have an OTDR, it can have a source and a power meter on it. So you could use OTDR for one provider, and when the next provider says, I want a source and power meter with a loopback, then you could use OTDR as your source, your power meter, and do your loopback testing, your loss testing, or your OTDR loopback testing. And the OTDR should have the probe as well, so you can do your pass-fail documentation auto-centering, uh, our most common one is a Tiber 2000, approved by the providers. Many times, that's what the service provider has as well. So you can compare notes for troubleshooting. But if you have the OTDR with source power meter inspection and a VFL on it, that's going to let you get handled at, at any job, right? Because typically, it's either going to be a source and power meter test or it's going to be an OTDR test. And since OTDR can do it all, if you have an OTDR, it should cover you for all service providers. So I kind of did not answer the question because the service provider is going to tell you what to do. If you have an OTDR, that's going to cover you at all jobs. Or maybe you got a crew with an OTDR since they're doing provider A three days a week and the other guys are going doing provider B, and maybe they got a cheaper handheld source and power meter. Well, good. Mike, that looks like the, the, the end of the questions. Um, I'd... Uh, like to thank everyone for their participation and um, 
and your interest. <clears throat> Again, the uh, resource information that you w w would like to have is available on tesco.com slash go slash JDSU. Uh, the link for this recording will also be available at that uh, portal page and uh, available for you uh, to review at your leisure. I want to thank everyone for their participation today. This concludes our webinar.